Sure. All right, good afternoon. I'm back. Um, so let's talk about uh, deep learning classification projects. So our lab, uh, we do lots of different projects, just like all of you do, uh, wherever you work. And um, I think that this is going to be something that happens in all aspects of the radiology enterprise. As I mentioned earlier, I do work in deep learning for NLP, but I also do work for detection and classification projects. I'm going to take us through one of those projects that will have a lot of tie-ins with Keith Dreyer's talk. Um, and I promise we didn't coordinate this talk, but you'll see why I said that. Um, so we developed a NEMRI classifier uh, earlier this year based on four, uh, 1,400 NEMRIs that we uh, hand-labeled based on the reports. And we labeled them with normal, abnormal for our detection task, ACL tear, and meniscal tear for our classification tasks. We extracted three series per exam, um, and then we had a holdout test set of 120 NEMRIs that we asked a panel of subspecialist MSK radiologists to, to read and label with these labels. They also had use of the EMR and the PAC, so we felt that that was a really nice ground truth test set. Our architecture was actually at the earlier stages based on a 2D architecture. We used con nets to transform uh, each uh, image in, in, in parallel to, uh, to feature maps. We transformed uh, the average of the feature maps into multidimensional vectors, which were then passed through the, uh, the fully connected layer to create a probability. Now, that was great, but the problem is that we have now three series and three labels, so we have nine con nets that we have to deal with. So we uh, ended up using logistic regression to transform those nine decisions into three uh, best weighted decisions based on the training data. And this was our result on the test set. You can see that we did exceedingly well for the abnormal and normal detection task. Uh, we also did very well for ACL and a little bit less well for meniscal tear. Now, as, as uh, Luciano just said, we didn't do any annotation or bounding boxes on our, on our images. This is, this is simply um, examination level labels. Um, and so you can imagine that our performance could improve on meniscal tear if had we done that. We then asked a few radiologists to also do the test set so we can uh, compare our performance of our model against uh, human radiologists. And we found that, you know, for two of the three labels, we, we did pretty well. So we were proud of ourselves, but what we really wanted to figure out is, you know, how would we use this model in practice? There's been a lot of talk about augmented radiology, cyborg radiologists. How would we actually use these, uh, the output of our model to help a radiologist make a decision? So I'm an MPH, I can design a, a drug trial. Why don't I design a crossover trial? So that's exactly what we did. We took two groups of radiologists uh, and randomized them. Uh, in this first group, there were four non-MSK rads and one orthopedic surgeon. In the second, there were three non-MSK rads and one orthopedic surgeon. The reason we included orthopedic surgeons is, as many of them will tell you, they can read these images on their own, at least that's what they say. And the idea is that maybe there's an opportunity to use AI to help the clinicians read the images in their clinic and potentially manage their own imaging. It's possible. We gave group A AI assistance, and in this case, it was simply the output of the model was given to uh, the reader, uh, the, the label and the probability that the model thought uh, in terms of confidence. We then had a washout period, and then we switched the groups. We randomized the order and switched the groups. So that way we could best tell what the effect of the AI assistance really was. And here were our results. We, uh, again, as a small sample size, we saw a trend in improvement on every category, even on meniscal tear, which was interesting because, again, that wasn't the highest performing. We saw a statistically significant uh, improvement in ACL tear. Uh, we, we did some more, uh, you know, statistical analysis. We found that the specificity also improved uh, for ACL tear, which means that there would be less false positives, taking fewer people to the OR uh, for suspected ACL tear. So, again, this kind of speaks back to what uh, Keith said at the beginning of the, of the conference that, you know, there are opportunities to use classifiers, even if they're not perfect, to help radiologists and others make better decisions. But before we got too carried away, I did want to take the next few minutes I have left to talk about bias, because I think this is really critical uh, and something to think about. So there's both AI system bias and human bias. Let's, uh, let's talk about AI system bias. This was a uh, figure from a blog post by an Australian radiologist uh, uh, named Luke Oakton Rayner. Uh, he was very critical of the NIH data set, and one of the reasons he was critical is that he said that the labels weren't very useful. Uh, this, these are the examples that he chose for positive for pneumothorax, and he circled in green all of the uh, positive pneumothorax uh, cases that had chest tubes. So if you train a classifier on that, the concern would be that you're just training a classifier to learn where a chest tube is and not what a pneumothorax is. An even better example came from the Google group then in a collaboration with Mount Sinai. They, they wanted to create a multi-institutional data set to predict pneumonia on chest x-rays. Sounds like a good idea. Uh, the trouble is, is when they trained their classifier and then they looked at what the classifier was uh, making its decisions on with these saliency maps, it turned out it was looking at the laterality marker. Why would it do that? Well, these, these two different hospitals use two different laterality markers. 
And hospital A had a 1% disease prevalence of pneumonia, and hospital B had a 34% disease prevalence. All it had to do was be a hospital classifier, and it did a great job of detecting pneumonia. This obviously is not clinically useful. So another, another example of bias. But before we blame all uh, bias on AI models, I think it's important to consider our own biases. And uh, at least for me and most of us, we get around with a uh, aid of a little helper here, and it's a GPS, right? And so we trust this GPS almost too much in certain cases, and things like this can happen. This is actually a photograph from someone who did follow their GPS onto a train track because they the GPS told them it was a road, and that's where they needed to go. Luckily, they survived. But this can happen uh, not infrequently to the point where now there's a term called death by GPS. And the reason this is important to, to bring up here is that there, we have an inherent bias called automation bias, that uh, we just have a tendency to trust the output of computers more than even our own sometimes uh, common sense. Um, and this can happen in airplane cockpits and ICUs and nuclear power plants. And so it's really important, I think, as we begin to think about how we're going to implement these systems. Um, real, it's a real sign. Um, we have to think about warnings like this, ways to inform the people using these models on the biases that might be present in the model itself, where it could fail, but also our own biases to say, hey, maybe you should consider all the clinical information when, when this thing says there's pneumonia, something like that. Uh, so again, in conclusion, uh, I believe classification tasks, as you've seen many times, is definitely doable. Um, I think augmented human classification is going to be very exciting, um, and I think there'll be different ways to do this. But really understanding and controlling for bias, I can't emphasize this enough, is going to be critical, particularly as we start to move uh, models from one institution to the other before we understand how well they're going to work. And thanks again.